It's joining us, Lee Brown, as a global sector lead uh, covering uh, the group of stocks, and uh, Moderna uh, down at the bottom of the performance list today. Uh, Lee, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here this morning. Uh, these shares are now down 50% in the past year. Uh, I guess in decent company, though, Pfizer is kind of in the same boat. Uh, where do we go from here for the COVID names? Well, clearly Moderna is suffering from a post-pandemic hangover. Everyone expected that to happen. We saw revenues plunge about 46% year over year to $1.8 billion. But I think it's important to note that despite that lackluster performance, it still handily beat conservative street expectations uh, in the range of 1.4 to 1.5 billion. I think the stock's uh, uh, under pressure uh, uh, b because of the guidance, um, which is uh, a bit open to interpretation. They, they said that they expect the upcoming flu season uh, in the U.S. to deliver around 50 million doses, which should support 2023 spike vac sales of around 6 billion at least. But the issue is year to date, SPAC, Spike Vax has generated 3.9 billion in sales. So that suggests Q4 Spike, spike Vax revenue of at least 2.1 billion. Why is that an issue? Concer consensus currently expects somewhere in the 3.4 billion range. And I think that's um, what's probably weighing on the stock. So the idea is that people are going to get a fresh Vax for the flu season like a typical flu shot now is that the is that the idea that's the expectation and i think the the worry is the guidance coming out on the 50 million doses supporting 6 billion of full year 2023 sales implies a run rate in q4 that's significantly below most analysts expectations now i will caveat that those estimates range from anywhere between 1.9 billion and as high as 4.8 billion there's clearly an analyst on the street that needs to recalibrate their figures but the average estimate um, is 3.4 billion and the implication is moderna will generate at least 2.1 billion the real question being what does that at least number come out to be? Now, is that disappointing because uh, it's not a heavy flu season? People aren't getting sick. Or are they getting sick and they just don't want the vaccine? Or are they doing other? I mean, like, didn't it used you to know, be? We've been, could... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, thanks Thanks for the question. We, we've been pounding the, the table on this for about a year, ever since the Kaiser Family Foundation came out with a pivotal survey, um, really highlighting the apathy of the U.S. market to get boosters. And, and that um, survey has proven to be absolutely spot on. So I don't think mm. this is um, surprising to anyone. I mean, the, the, uh, to the point, despite the nearly 50% year over year decline in sales largely driven um, by the the uh, lagging spike vax, which is the COVID-19 uh, 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 vaccine for Moderna. Um, it actually came above street expectations. Uh, really where our specialists are focused though and where we should spend our time if we're talking about Moderna is their pretty robust late stage pipeline because that's the future. Um, they're, uh, they've got six phase three programs that they're hoping to launch by 2025. And I think where we're mostly focused on is on the respiratory vaccine, what's called an RSV, um, which is indicated for the uh, adult population. Um, and, and this is also goes by uh, uh, MRNA 1345. And that's gonna be for uh, what type of respiratory ailments? Well, RSV. Um, is is the ailment? It's it's uh, quite contagious. Most people contract uh, RSV before they're even two years old. I think the market's going to be driven by the under two year old cohort, uh, and and also the ability to dose uh, uh, pregnant women. So that's uh, maternal, sorry sorry maternal immunity um, passing uh, to the baby. Uh, again, 1345 right now is indicated for adults. And I think the more interesting aspect of the competitive uh, landscape is one, there's somewhere upward of 12, as, as possibly as high as 16 uh, candidates entering the RSV market over the next few years. So it's going to be increasingly crowded. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. Moderna is already behind 
uh, GSK um, with their uh, 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 RC vaccine. And uh, I'm, uh, there's um, uh, a Brit, a bit, a bit, a Bismo and a Brexy are, are already launched. They were approved earlier this summer. And I think they're going to really struggle. It's uh, GSK's a RexV and Pfizer's a, a Brismo. And um, but where our specialists are coming out is don't count Moderna out just yet. I think near term, their RSV vaccine is going to really struggle. Mm. But because of their mRNA platform, they can eventually launch an RSV flu vaccine or some combination vaccine, maybe incorporate a, a next gen COVID into that. And we think that will propel Moderna into a leadership position, despite it being increasingly uh, crowded. OK. I uh, love the specific uh, uh, details on what comes and the competition as well that they're going to be going into, Lee. Real fast, though, before we let you go, we can't have a healthcare conversation without talking uh, weight loss drugs, right? I mean, it seems like the spotlight very clearly has been shining on this area. Uh, do you have a favorite? Do you think that the market's response has been appropriate, outlandish, something in between? Yeah, I mean, this is a fun topic to discuss. Obviously, the current players are Eli Lilly's Monjaro, um, which is a dual acting uh, drug, uh, GLP. Uh, and uh, uh, it's certainly uh, doing quite well. Um, we, we saw Lilly's revenue rocket by 37% year over year to roughly 9.5 billion and easily top consensus of 9 billion by roughly uh, 5%. Uh, a good part of that was driven by Manjaro. It delivered 1.4 billion um, uh, and beat consensus by nearly 12%. Uh, another type two diabetes drug, Jardians, also posted impressive growth. It was up 22% year over year to just over 700 million, but it still fell short of uh, really uh, robust consensus expectations. Um, here's a story. Uh, Manjaro um, is only approved for type 2 diabetes. Now they're working for FDA approval in weight management or obesity, uh, however you'd like to frame that indication. They directly compete against Novo Nordisk, which has two drugs that use the same active pharmaceutical ingredients. So they've got Azimpic, which is semi-glutide, and it's indicated for type 2 diabetes. And then they have Wagovi, which is also a higher dose semi-glutide, but that's separately brand it and indicate it for weight management. Uh, wh where this gets interesting is near term versus long term. Um, there's all kinds of, um, I think, hyperbolic discussions, but mm. supported by some management commentary on what this means even outside of healthcare. We have airplane uh, analysts talking about <laughs> I know. the average weight of passengers going down, so they're going to save on fuel costs. We have Krispy Kreme kind of blaming <laughs> these drugs on on, on what about, top line. Pressures. What about burgers? Are they getting looped in? We got to jump because yeah, we got the Red Robin got, CEO you know, coming it's, up, it's, Lee. He's not going to get. He's not going to lose customers because of weight loss drugs, is he? Yeah, I mean, they've got obviously the big uh, uh, Coca Cola and, and Pepsi and and and, and the. Uh, Nestle and you know all, all of this right but yeah. I think short term what people have to realize and I'll make this quick yeah. I don't know how long no we're, got, we're running but, out. all right so so reimbursements constrained outside of type 2 diabetes these drugs cost about a thousand dollars a month out of pocket so uptake is going to be driven by two things one really restrictive um uh uh, insurance coverage that won't pay for it until more competition arrives and we see more pricing uh, competition. Mm. Uh, and, and second of all, both Wagovi and Majaro, and, and to some extent Azimpic as well, are supply constrained. I mean, both mm. um, uh, companies are having a very difficult time keeping up with demand. And so near term, I think some of these um, draconian expectations in terms of the negative impact on on industry laterals is probably overdone but longer term what i would suggest is sensitivity or scenario analysis around terminal value any anyone that gets geeky on on um stock valuations knows how important long-term um, terminal values are sure thing. Uh, they typically drive 60 to 70 percent of current market valuation and so it's not um inappropriate to to maybe take a a, a, a sharpening sharpen pencil to what you think the the long-term impact could be and that okay. can translate to new term price volatility let's continue that conversation because uh you've got one of the best takes i think i've heard on it so far very reasoned uh analysis of it that uh, gives us some good uh 
uh, things to think about here as the market's gone so ballistic over it. Lee, thanks a lot <laughs> for the details. Great convo. Lee Brown, Global Sector Lead for Healthcare at Third Bridge.